People make it hard. People are doing great jobs here. Antonio literally is the best MC I think I've ever seen. Uh, Steve, the Dusties, Brittany, let's give them a round of applause. This event has been phenomenal. So, this is actually the name of this talk, Build Something It Ain't Magic. Uh, the hashtag is magical, not magic. We'll get into it. Before I do anything of any significance, I want to start with this guy. <laughs> do you guys know what you say when you hear? Who's been in a club before you hear? Where are Brooklyn at? It's on songs. What are you supposed to say? Right here. <laughs> I want to make sure we're committed. It's post-lunch. <laughs> All right? I'm from Brooklyn. So if I say where Brooklyn at, you're supposed to say right here. So what if I say where Des Moines at? Come on, guys. Could do better than that. Where Des Moines at? Right here. There we go. So I'm Ron J. Williams, and the thing that I want to assert to you today is that being an entrepreneur can be magical, but it ain't magic. And what I mean by that is we love to hear these stories and celebrate these stories where somebody writes an idea on a napkin and gets funded by somebody big, and they go on to make a billion bucks. That's magic. That doesn't happen for most people. What happens for most people is they work for six months, they got a spreadsheet with 500 lines of VCs, they pitch 499 and the 500 says yes, that's magical. So what I wanna talk about today is this notion that we all in this room are working on things that mean a lot to us, that we're working hard at. Your success will be determined not by lightning striking or an apple hitting your head with the one good idea you'll ever have, but in fact by persevering, uh, veering. So this is me, why am I in any way, shape or form qualified to talk about this? Because I made tons of mistakes, because um, I built some stuff. Uh, and we'll probably do some of it differently. I'm Ron J. Dub, by the way, on Twitter. If you want to shout at me or say that what I'm saying makes no sense uh, or is brilliant, um, the hashtags that I'm sort of talking about today are magical, not magic, and of course, think Iowa. Um, I run a company called Nodes, um, and Steve actually said some really brilliant things around this idea of how we can use social data better. The big idea for us is we are connected to so many more people than we ever could do anything with in any kind of practical way. We connect to them for specific reasons and specific moments, how can we unlock the value of those relationships in the specific times where we need them? How can I actually ubiquitously make sure that everybody, when you're, whether you're advocating for a candidate you believe in on a specific issue, or trying to raise money for a Kickstarter campaign you just gave money to, who are the right people in your network to bring to bear at that moment? Can I show you the right faces in the right places at the right moments? And that's what Nodes is. And I think the most important thing to kind of realize for me, I realized is, I ask why, not a lot. I got a lot of questions. This has been the organizing principle of my life. I'll explain why that weird graphic is up there in a second, I promise. So before Nodes, we had built this company and this product called SnapGoods. SnapGoods is the simplest and safest way to rent gear and high-end gadgets from people that you know or don't know in your network or neighborhood. That actually led to Nodes. But before I got to Nodes, the question I first asked was, I wanted to impress uh, a woman, my ex-girlfriend. I wanted to grab a motor, always, right? There's always a woman in the story. I wanted to impress a woman with a motorcycle. None of my buddies that had bikes were gonna be in town this Labor Day weekend three years ago. So I convinced a total stranger on Craigslist to rent me his motorcycle. <laughs> right? Kind of a weird transaction. Uh, I was pretty certain I was gonna be clubbed in the head, by the way, I was not. And the question I asked after I came out of that, by the way, I rolled up to her apartment, I told her we were gonna go biking, she comes down in like sweaty yoga gear with a bicycle and I'm sitting outside, for those of you who are old enough to appreciate this, on a motorcycle looking like black Fonzarelli. It was amazing. <laughs> it was amazing. And it worked because I actually married her about four months ago, so it worked. I uh, impressed the girl, got the girl. Um, so the why not in that moment for me was, why is it not possible for us to access the goods we need whenever we need them from people nearby who just have them in their closets, on their shelves, in their garages? and that led to snap goods. As we were working at that business, we realized that we weren't doing a good job of unlocking people's social network connections. When they needed something in our system, we told them to post it on Facebook. Hey, I'm looking for a camera. I, this happened this morning. I actually needed a charger. I left my power cord for my MacBook Pro, uh, my MacBook Air, um, in New York, like I always do when I travel. And I needed this $80 thing that, that's really how Apple makes its money, right, is me forgetting chargers. Um, and typically, we'd ask people to post that to, Snap, uh, to, to Facebook or Twitter, tell the entire world that you're looking for something, and the numbers say that somebody should respond. But how many people in my network can actually help me in Des Moines with a MacBook charger? Not that many. 
And so instead, shouldn't we be trying to understand the connections? Why can't we make our network sociable, uh, searchable? And that was the precursor to uh, knows that question of why is this not possible? This bolo actually comes from a really real thing that happened that lets me know that I've been kind of like this for a while and I want to kind of encourage you guys to, to power uh, a lot of what you do with question asking. I'm eight years old, I was smaller this way and this way, um, and we were going to an apple orchard, my class, and they'd already prepped us for the fact that the tallest trees had the best apples at the top. And there were bigger kids going and I said to myself, I don't want to fight about these little apples on the bottom with these big kids. Why can't I actually do something to get to the apples at the top? So I built a bolo, because I was also a big fan of Thundercat, out of string and cardboard, right? Real thing. Why not? So Chandler, why not? What this is ultimately about today, the, the, the real sort of substance of this talk, I hope, is really about you guys channeling the energies that you're putting into building, and hopefully, particularly if you're at that early phase of just starting out, just trying to start something, remembering this. For me, I'm excited about people and connections and organizing the world's connections into ways that are actionable for people, not just marketers. But I always keep people at the center of what we're doing. When you're building stuff, how many people already have launched something? How many people are thinking about launching something? How many people think they want to launch something but haven't launched yet? Along that spectrum, I encourage you, unless you're building ad tech or a trading system for like algorithmic trading, keep people at the center of what you're doing. Remember that there's a face and a body and a real pain point on the other end of whatever tech or non-tech you're building. I think that helps us out immensely in what we do. I wound up having these conversations sometimes where somebody approaches me, uh, we get to talking about what I do, what they do, and they say to me, I could never do what you do. How many people had a conversation like this or some your friends are like, oh man, it's just so hard, right? Like we've kind of, we've had these conversations. And it's a part of the cult of personality, which I want to deconstruct a little bit today, around entrepreneurship. Like, I'm the guy that happened to fall into a great idea, it's the last great idea I ever will have, I better kill this thing now or else I'll never have another opportunity to actually build something. And so they say stuff like, I can never do what you do. Now, if what you mean is take crazy risks and not sleep a lot, I don't know, maybe you could, maybe you couldn't, people have different risk tolerances. But if what you're really talking about is building something that doesn't exist or solving a problem for people that is not currently being solved, Everybody has the capacity to do that. So when I get this, I can never do what you do, the first thing I do is politely disagree. And I respond. <laughs> <laughs> I love this icon. That is simply not true. So I'm down in South by Southwest as an example, a quick story, uh, this past year, in March of this year. And there's this very, very successful woman. She's got an MBA. She is working away in corporate America, killing it as a strategic partnership person. And we get to talking about nodes, and we get to talking about snap goods. And she's like, wow, I just, I can't believe that, you know, you do stuff like this. I could never do what you do. And I was like, that's odd, because you certainly seem a hell of a lot smarter than me, I'm saying in my head. Um, and so then I kind of waited for a second. And I said, well, tell me about what you do at home. Like, what does your life actually look like? What are you really excited about? What is your passion? And she said, well, I really love pottery. I really love like the sort of Patrick Swayze throwing clay on the, the wheel and <laughs> without, without all the invisible, I, yeah, this is, this is pottery, by the way. This is pottery. Um, uh, with all the weird haunting, right? So she loves, she loves creating things with her hands. She loves, and she, she wants to be an artist. And as I keep asking her, it turns out that ideally, in her ideal world, she'd actually be making these pots and selling them. She'd actually become an artist, but she had no way how to bridge that gap. And so I dig into it a little bit more with her. And again, I'm just Socratically kind of getting her to where I want to get her, right where I want her. And I'm like, well, so what do you hate about this sort of process of trying to be a potter, wishing you'd be a potter, not being able to do it? And she starts describing the shortcomings of the studio system and how it's super expensive and they don't really keep your stuff if you're not serious. And, and I was like, cool, well, how would you make it different? And you know what happened before we were kind of done? She had described this ideal studio that sounded pretty cool, and in and of itself was an interesting opportunity. And I stopped, and I was like, so do you think there are other people like you? Maybe not just for pottery, but for other art that would love a studio like this that was subsidized by those people who were the most active in helping them merchandise their products and whatever? And she was like, oh shit, yeah, maybe. And that was the moment where I said to her, I referred her back to this icon. I keep it in my pocket, I just whip it out for people. Um, <laughs> Um, but the point there was not that I'm some kind of guru about pulling ideas out of her. She had these ideas, she had this thing that she was passionate about. And that's maybe the first tenet that I would really, really 
weigh heavily on is, I will disagree, there was a speaker earlier, I think, who was successful, and I would say that it's not that he didn't have passion, I think he was passionate about the thing that he described, which was teaching. I think you have to work on things that you care about because stuff will get hard, and when it does, the thing that's gonna suck you through and pull you through is gonna be the fact that you really do care about the problem that you're solving. Whoops. So, I've been talking sort of theoretically about some of this stuff. I'm telling you guys that you should build uh, against problems that you care about. Um, and if you do that, that things will be okay. They won't always be okay. Uh, I do wanna talk pretty concretely though about uh, some ideas and maxims that you can sort of keep in your head. And Jay-Z is another guy from Brooklyn. Uh, you guys know who Jay-Z is? I kid, I kid, I know you know who Jay-Z is. Um, but I, I uh, another quick story, I almost deferred college for a year. I went to Harvard um, and I had this moment with my dad. I'd been on local radio in New York a little bit. I was particularly good at extemporaneously rhyming, which some of you guys may know is freestyle. Um, and I was, I was like, yeah, I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna not go to Harvard and be a rapper. And um, <laughs> my dad tried his best, kind of, it was like chicken. He tried his best, like cool Cosby sort of, okay, yeah, I support you in whatever you do. And uh, he said this, and I was like, Pop, that's great, so I'm gonna go. And then he waited about uh, 45 seconds, and then uh, he was like, are you effing crazy? <laughs> uh, so, <laughs> I showed up that fall. Um, but hip hop is, if nothing else, is a super entrepreneurial genre. Uh, these guys own all kinds of different stuff, and I think, personally, he's got amazing lyrics and embodies a lot of the things that I think about. For me, because I do love rap, and because I do listen to a lot of it, these lyrics stay in my mind, and stick in my mind when I'm sort of thinking about business stuff, so I'm known to break up a team meeting when we have our weekly kickoff, and I'm like, here's something I just heard that pertains to our goal, or our push for this week. So, here are three things that I kind of want you guys to keep in mind. This is a great lyric right here, actual lyric. We don't believe you, you need more people. This is from a song called The Takeover, uh, which Jay dropped on the album The Blueprint 2001. Um, ironically, the, the week that the towers went down. Um, there are two parts to this that I think are really crucial. What you've heard a lot, and there have been brilliant people on the stage today talking about a variety of experiences. The thing that to me you hear the most, um, which I find really interesting is, this idea that you have to have team. How many people here have teams that they work with? How many people here think they have no teams yet? They haven't built their team. But you have people that have started believing in you. You've gotten maybe the first person you've told the idea to who maybe believes the first person you're piloting with. Your team doesn't just start with the first person who quits their job and starts eating ramen noodles to support you. As soon as you have something you think is interesting, you go find the people that believe. You go bounce the ideas off of other people. Those people, your co-founders, find them fast. Find a technical co-founder if you're building software, certainly. Uh, your advisors, early investors, customers. Even the people that don't pay, the people that give you feedback, that is your team. We don't believe you, you need more people. You need people to have your back. Any person, any megalomaniac that says that he or she built a business all by themselves, I don't wanna spoil the plot here, they're lying. <laughs> it's simply not true. The second piece of this is, once you get that core group, we don't believe you need more people applies to customers outside the building, not the familiar people. Not the people that put your ugly art on the refrigerator when you were small, right? Not your best friend, not your boyfriend, not your girlfriend, but people who don't know you at all. The people, remember I talked about people, that you believe you're solving a problem for. What do they think about what you're doing? If you're here not just to build a startup, but to actually build a sustainable business, you need the validation of strangers, right? <laughs> well played. That was, that was not a plan, I promise that was not a plan. He started playing, it's actually got a great riff uh, from the Stones, I believe. So anyways, it's a great song. Um, that, I owe you a drink, that was amazing. Uh, so, the point there is that once you get that team, that core of the team that is familiar, you have to start thinking about getting out of the building. You'll hear guys like Steve Blank and Eric Ries, kind of the fathers of the lean startup movement, talk about getting out of the building. It is so real. How do you shorten the cycles between what you think is true and what they need and between what they validate you actually need? We keep a document uh, on, on our team that I'm in charge of that I let everybody have access to. We're a small team of six, but it's what we thought, what we did, what we learned, slash how we were wrong, how we changed. Because you're gonna be wrong, but how do you shorten those cycles? We need more people. Because if you don't, and you think you're gonna do it with a small crew, this is what happens to you. Six pack abs and you get murdered by a bunch of people invading your country. 
Hopefully it's not that literal. Uh, but the fact of the matter is there are other people in the market that are learning as quickly as you or faster and doing stuff. And so get out there with your team, with your squad, and then get people that don't know you to validate what you're doing. I dumbed down my lyrics to double my dollars. Another, I mean, this is really a favorite of mine. Moment of Clarity on the Black Album. Um, I don't know the year of that one. That would be, I think it was 2007, I believe. Um, the trick with this one, if you guys don't get it, is this idea that simplicity rules. The lesson that I learned, um, which was kind of interesting, is I, uh, when I first was pitching Snap Goods, right, this sort of peer to peer rental business, uh, I hated the word rental for things that pertain to what I thought was kind of more upmarket stuff. And so I assiduously avoided the word. I'd call it local goods on demand from people you trust. What does that mean? Seriously, right? Um, goods on access nearby. Literally, what does that mean? Dumb it down. And it doesn't mean that your customers are stupid. It doesn't mean that you are stupid. It just means that if I tell you what I do, the surefire way to actually measure your efficacy as a communicator, as a pitcher of your business, and frankly of your pitch, is listen to somebody else, retell your story. Like we're all here networking and meeting a lot of wonderful people, high-fiving, thanks to Antonio, there are people linking up after this. Listen to what they say to the next person when somebody else walks up and says, oh, so what's that guy working on? What's that woman working on? And if they can't tell your story with the same clarity that you believe you did, your story was not clear. So dumb it down. Ultimately, the ability to sell to market will come down to clarity of your vision, clarity of your message. And so what I've learned the hard way is even with nodes, there are a lot of people in the space, I think Brewster's an amazing app, there are five other companies working on social and personal data. And when we first started, we'd asked a simple question, why can I make my network searchable? We didn't yet know what we wanted to do with that. We didn't yet know that we'd be focusing literally on putting faces on websites everywhere and cause-based campaigns. We didn't know any of that. So I didn't really have a great explanation. So I was like, oh, you know, ubiquitous social context. What does that mean? Let's keep it simple. Um, because simplicity really does rule. Do you guys recognize this? The pet rock. Complex idea? Not so much. <laughs> Not so much at all. In today dollars, the pet rock sold. Are you ready to be really angry? $70 million in today dollars, a product, I kid you not. Right, super simple idea, well marketed. It's in a box, it's a rock, it's kind of like a pet. We're gonna call it Pet Rock. <laughs> I don't know where they came up with that name, that's super crazy. Um, but the fact is, the real point that I would make here is that you get real gains, you get a real win out of understanding your business or your idea, the problem you're solving well enough to be able to explain it so simply that my four-year-old niece could explain it. I had a great debate with a person who has been at times like a mentor to me, and we, we had a fundamental divergence around this. He said, well, some things, because all the tech that goes into nodes is super complicated. And I pushed back and said, well, I think we should still be able to explain the problem we're solving to anyone. It doesn't matter how complex the behind the screen is, right? What the great Wizard of Oz is doing behind the screen. The explanation of the solution that we're actually dealing with, uh, addressing should be simple. So I want to drive that home. Last one. I'm focused, man. So another Jay-Z lyric, obviously. Uh, this is the beginning of this song called The Best of Me. And I think this really embodies in many ways what I hope we all are getting better at and what I've struggled with myself is somebody, I think it was um, Danielle um, from Referly was saying, you've got to get good at saying no. And I've, I may have a different take on some of that stuff, but the one thing I agree on is part of your job is to get really good at understanding what a distraction might look like in your day. You're going to be really excited about the core of your idea. Super excited. You're going to start to get, hopefully, some validated learning. You're, you'll start to get some people, right, so we can believe you. And at that moment, what's going to happen, and I'll tell you a story about what happened with us, you will begin to recognize that there are multiple directions that you could go in. So let's flash forward, flash back for us a year. We built this thing that, for the first time, lets people search across Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter. Had our first kind of wonderful success moment when one of our early users said, man, I had no way to get to this amazing investor, in this case, uh, I think Mitch Kapoor. Um, 
I had no way to get to him because I wasn't connected to him on LinkedIn, but it turned out that because you guys surfaced that I had a friend that I'm connected to on Twitter that I'm really close with who tweets back and forth with him, and because you're revealing engagement, I was able to ask for an introduction and get it. I think that's kind of the point, right? You're hearing this from other folks in the space. Our networks are sprawling and large, and for many of us comprise thousands of connections. How do we make more use of them? So I was like, yeah, we're gonna do social search. And then I realized a lot of people were doing social search, and I was like, not as exciting. And then when I looked at my data, I realized that there were tons of people doing tons of different kinds of things with our platform. Some seemed to be using the, the, sort of, the ability to search their network to figure out um, who they should pull into a room to interview to recruit. Some were using it for PR. Some were using it for marketing. And then one of my good buddies, a guy named Barrett Sunday Thurston, former web editor of The Onion and author of a book called How to Be Black, New York Times bestseller. It is actually named that, though. It's really funny. Um, it won't do what you think it It'll do, based on the title. Um, <laughs> actually, I don't even know what you think, and now I feel like I've just stepped in it. I'm sorry about that. Um, um, I realized that he was on our system more than anybody else, 110,000 followers on Twitter, and I was like, what the hell is this guy doing in our system that other people aren't? So what I do, I think you heard some really smart people tell you something similar. I went and sat down with him, and I've got three hours of audio that I could literally play for you. If you had three hours and some whiskey, we could sit down and play for three hours. I'm talking to him and somebody on his team about what they were doing, and it turned out that what they were doing was going through all of his contacts. He had a, his own spreadsheet of about 7,000 lines where he was using our tool to segment his audience with updated information about what people have been talking about because he was about to launch this book. He was then using that to do differentiated asks to each of them. I'm trying to throw an event in Chicago. Here are my Chicago event people. Here are my people that spend a lot of time talking about blacks and politics. Here are my people that talk about comedians. He was doing different asks by understanding the context of his network. And I was like, I think that is in the direction of the problem that I'm most excited to solve. But the problem for me was there were four or five other use cases that I also wanted to tackle. So we got distracted for a little bit. And what I'm here to say is this single short sentence, I'm focused, man, is a really important one because saying no is hard but it's easier to do specific tests where you invest in that test and validate that it's good or bad, and then you can always do that second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth thing, rather than putting a little bit of yourself and spreading the resources of your team, and if your team is just you, you're spreading yourself thin, to do a little bit of everything poorly. So what this one reminds me of is stay focused. It is hard to say no to opportunity, but even as you start to get paying customers, there are gonna be times where you're gonna be faced, we recently had to say no to a very large customer. I don't wanna give anything away. We, there was somebody who wanted to work with us but on a very specific set of terms that would not have worked for us and would have taken us away from the roadmap that we've established for where we think we can be strong, where we can be the best and where I'm excited to solve these problems every day. And we had to say no even though money was on the line. And I encourage you to do so. And remember Jay-Z, of course. Because if you don't, you do this. You confuse yourself and you confuse your customers. <laughs> exactly, right? It takes a second. You're like, wait, what's wrong with that sign? Oh, wait, right? This is a real thing. If you are confused about what you are, we did this with SnapGoods as well. We were trying to be everything to everyone. If I had to redo SnapGoods today, instead of being, even once we got the message down and we simplified it, we were still trying to do it across multiple categories. Airbnb, who here knows what Airbnb does? Right? Really simple. They want you to travel like, a, stay like a human when you travel, right? Like homes. We were doing photography equipment, all kinds of high-end gear and gadgets and camping equipment, everything else. And even though we have a few prevalent categories, we kept talking to all of them for a while. If I had to do it all over again today, I would literally make SnapGoods just photo equipment. Or better yet, just photo accessories. Or even better yet, just tripods. Which sounds crazy, but why would I do that? I'd do that because even if you were disappointed, if I said, yeah, you can find accessories, you can find tripods nearby from people that we've vetted, we make it a safe transaction. If you got excited about that as a photographer, great, you know what we do, it's memorable. Even if you didn't, you'd at least know what we did and you'd be like, man, I wish you'd do that for motorcycles, but you'd know what we did. Focus. So just to kind of wrap up, I don't want to be theoretical here. These are the things that we actually engage, these are some of the tools that we engage all the time to validate some of our thinking before we build anything. Because the other responsibility of the leadership of any effort, organization, company, startup, analog business, is not to waste the precious resources over building stuff before you validate that somebody actually wants the solution that you're proposing. So SurveyMonkey, sometimes we'll pull it in and we'll figure out, well, if we send a survey out to 50 or 100 people, 
what kind of feedback do they give us about the pain point that we think they have? And maybe there have literally been times where we're like, new product we want to launch on the platform. Oh, yeah, I think there's a huge opportunity. And we send it out to 20 PR professionals. This happened nine months ago. And the answers are so mixed about what I thought was their pain point, it was clear I didn't get that market. We wound up not building that thing. It saved us time. Unbounce is this thing that does, it helps you with split testing. In other words, maybe you don't have your value proposition nailed down. Maybe you sent out a survey and you, you sort of know what the direction is that you want to do, but you don't know how, are you expressing that you want to build Google for poodles or do you want to build eBay for poodles? Or maybe, you know, maybe it's something sort of somewhere in between. Any random person that lands on your page, they'll be served with a random version and you get to look at the data. How many people out of 100 converted on the Google for poodles versus the eBay for poodles? I don't know why I'm talking about poodles. <laughs> a beautiful thing is we use Facebook ads. Any of you guys ever bought Facebook ads? Even if you don't, wonderful way to actually size your market. They've got great tools that let you literally cut your market down to, I want people in Des Moines who are between this age, that are male or female, they're married, single, gone to college, not going to college, and you can target a very specific audience. Same with Google AdWords, but not quite as flexible in the demographics. Why am I talking about these tools? Because after you convince that initial team, what do you got to do? You got to go find more people. Put something in front of them, and if they leave you their email, they're telling you that they're interested in this fake service that you haven't even launched yet. Why is that important? Because you're validating assumptions before you go build anything. Whoops, I'm not very good at this clicker. Um, so the last thing I want to leave with you guys is kind of a summation. I do believe that you have to start with the problems that you care about because fundamentally it will get hard. There will be nights where you're like, man, I, something's not working. Some person's not working well. Some relationship's not working well. And if you're not excited about the customer base you're dealing with, if you're not excited about the problem that you're solving, I personally believe you will burn yourself out. If you are just going, and I think as Steve Kay said, to flip a quick buck and there's nothing wrong with that, and you're like, oh, somebody should solve that and I don't care about it, that's a very different interaction that you're gonna have with that 18 months, four years, seven years it takes you to actually build that company. People love to say, I'm an overnight success after four years of busting your hump. So you need to be passionate. Start building your team now, keep simplifying, keep clarifying, the focus thing also can be read as decide what you can be the best at and kick ass at that thing. And obviously these things tie closely together. But what I want to sort of leave you with is if you take this all together, what am I really saying? There's no lightning bolt. There's no apple that falls in your head and there's only one. You'll never have another shot at it. All these different things can be magical as you experience these moments where you get your first customer, you get your first hundred customers, but it's not magic. You guys can do this and happy to support and talk about this stuff after. I'm Ron J. Dub. Ron J. Dub, Ron J. Williams, thank you, Ron. Uh, if you guys have a question, please line up right now behind these two, uh, these two microphones. Now, Ron, I've known you for a long time, way before you ever were one of Fast Company's 100 most creative people in business. I knew you back when you were Whiskey Fridays and bars, you know, hanging out with friends, trying to, trying, I know, building businesses. Uh, th this may seem like a, a broad question, Ron, but what have you been able to do throughout your career and your experiences when, to get people to believe in you and what you're doing? I mean, right now, a lot of entrepreneurs out here, they have ideas, they have rough ideas. Maybe they're a little, little broad, they're not, they're not as focused, but when did you start finding success with getting that person across from the table to say, oh, tell me more about that, Ron, beyond immediately being kind of like dismissive? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, I think in my experience, you have to be open to honest feedback. And what that means is if there are a couple of different dimensions, if you're telling a story to someone and they're not being responsive, there's one of three things, give or take, that are kind of happening. Either they're the wrong person to be talking to, either your story isn't a good one, or you're telling your story poorly. That's pretty much it. So you can work on those three things, but the way that I think you actually get better is by opening yourself up to that feedback and asking them what, was it, what doesn't work for you about what I'm saying. Am I talking about this incorrectly? Is this a pro I literally, true story, I had a VC fall asleep on me. <laughs> Come on, like fall asleep on me. We were, at, we were at a really fancy hotel in New York. It was his idea to meet. I was like, this is, I can't think of a worse feeling for an entrepreneur. Like, you're like, I came with all my stories and this amazing, huge opportunity. And this guy was like, yeah, fell asleep on me. 
that was a wake up call. I was doing something wrong. And so I think that's part of it is seeking out people in your life. Again, build that team of people who can give you honest feedback and say, I like the idea in theory, but the way you're describing it doesn't seem feasible. And so people are losing interest or it sounds totally feasible, but it sounds like it's a market of about a dollar, not $1 billion, but like it sounds like it's a dollar market, like it's a tiny market or whatever the thing is. But I think that's being open that feedback, that honest feedback. Great, I have a question right over here. Okay, so if I understood recently, you got married, and I'm wondering how you continue to be a good entrepreneur without being a shitty husband. <laughs> You're probably still trying to get the hang of it, but I'm curious how, how things have changed. I, uh, I don't want to, I'm going to, I hope that my wife, and I think she's watching, well, I will say I'm not a shitty husband. I will say, uh, honestly, part of the reason why she is my partner and part of the reason why uh, I think she's amazing is, um, I'll tell a story about her for a second and kind of our relationship. I woke up one night after we keep a whiteboard in our apartment. Right, so I can like get up and do these kinds of things. I woke up at some weird hour and kind of scribbled some stuff that I was um, that was keeping me up at night, and I then went back to sleep. And uh, I woke up in the morning, and this is after tons of hours worked and her going through like a fundraising process with me and generally being stressed. And there was an arrow, and it was all my scribbles, which I don't even know if I could read them when I woke up the second time. And she said, "I love your brain." And that for me was a seminal moment because I was like, you know, I don't know if I could do this without a person who actually, she doesn't tolerate me being an entrepreneur. She helps me be a better version of myself, but she knows that this is my most authentic me, is building stuff that I care about. And so that's not, I hope you're with a person like that, and if you're not, drop them. But <laughs> the truth is that that's, that is to me, I mean, the answer is I try my best to be aware. I try for, for me now, like, you know, our team is growing. I can't be out four days, five days a week the way I was two, three years ago precisely because I want to make sure that I'm attentive to her and that you know, she's actually growing a business. But the fact is also just the substrate of that is she's awesome and, and really is excited about what we're doing, about what I'm doing. As you gave that answer, I think I saw like 18 dudes pull out their phone like, I love you, baby. Thank you. <laughs> I so appreciate you. <laughs> Thank you for making me the best version of me. That's, re that's real right there. That's real. That's some notebook Ryan Gosling kissing in the rain. <laughs> Spider-Man upside down. Nice. <laughs> He's like, thanks, man. All right. You can tell I've known this guy for a long Thank time. Yes. Uh, again, if you have more questions, step up to the microphone. Uh, Ron, this top check mark right here. Start building your team now. Yeah. Early in your career and even now, as you went about building your team, were you specifically looking at people that were just vested in your success or were you strategically looking at different categories that you needed to fill? Marketing expertise, finance expertise, tech expertise, et cetera. No, I wish I could say I've been that sort of, exhibited that kind of forethought or been that insightful. I think what, what I find to be true is you find people that you want to invest in them, um, whether or not they have anything to sort of directly invest in you, that you, you want to invest in them. Um, and then obviously you want to find people that want to invest in you. And the relationships grow. I mean, I think that, that is the first part. Because remember, when I say start building your team, I don't necessarily mean like find your CFO, find your CTO, find your CMO. I mean this, some people here are gonna leave, and whether you realize it or not explicitly, are gonna be on each other's teams as they leave this room, as they leave this conference. Uh, because you're gonna be advocating for each other. I got, I'm gonna big them up. I got some boys, they run a company called Field Lens. I'm a big believer. I'm using my time on stage to talk about them, not my company. I'm a fan. I don't need options in their company. I'm a big fan, I believe in what they're doing, I think there's a big opportunity. So finding those people, and frankly, and you and I have talked on camera before, investing in people that you genuinely believe in yourself, it is the most selfless and also selfish thing you can do because you put a team of people around you that know that you have their best interests and want to reciprocate. Now, when it's come time to like hire people, yeah, obviously, if you're building software, go find a CTO, go find a lead technical person. If you're, if you're building something that, uh, where design is important, go find a chief creative. Those things become more apparent but don't wait until you need an actual position filled to start recruiting. You're recruiting all the time. It doesn't mean recruiting like running up on people and saying, what can you do for me? But you're finding people that you want to invest in. Life isn't short, it's long. Fill it with relationships that matter. So as you, as you read about the New York entrepreneur scene, it seems like it's growing very quickly right now. And as someone that it sounds like you've been from the area for a while, were you there before and after kind of the big growth? And has there been something that you've seen that's changed to cause it? Yeah, I mean, in, in many ways, being out here to me resembles New York circa 1999, 2000 in some ways, like, but better. Um, 
what has effectively happened in a true story is I was contemplating moving out to the West Coast in 2008 um, to go sort of just get into the scene. Um, and I think I'd probably mimic some of what some of the morning speakers uh, talked about, which was I thought New York wasn't a place I needed to be. And then right as I was feeling that, I started to sort of look around and go to a few events and I realized that what was happening out there, which is happening here, is this wonderful, what I would call kind of pollination and recombination. In other words, there are a lot of people talking the same language, thinking the same way, and putting infrastructure. Those people are people like Jeff and this team, the Prairie team, that are putting together the infrastructure and the platforms so that you can all talk to each other and become supports for each other. And those relationships beget new opportunities exponentially. Right? You and I working together, you know, that's two of us. Four of us working together is not four times as good. It's four times whatever the size of our networks are and the potential for opportunities. So that's what happened in New York, frankly, is there was some tipping point where you had people like Fred Wilson at Union Square Ventures and other individuals that had material exits and were investing in really serious startups that were becoming highly regarded, like Foursquare. Um, and I think that that gave validation that New York was, was uh, doing well. Google and Facebook moving headquarters, not headquarters, but moving major offices, Twitter having an engineering office uh, in New York. And, and what I'm excited about is when I come out here, when you see guys like Dave McClure jump on planes and travel all across the world, the new world is wherever there are smart people and they're everywhere, if you have the tools and the systems to support them, they will build amazing and epic things. And so I see it happening out here. So anybody that's thinking about coming to New York, I'd love to have you out. We'll go for a Whiskey Friday. But you guys are building something amazing out here for those of you guys that are out here, so. Got one last question over here. Sure. Thanks for coming out, Ron. Uh, your last point here is solve a problem you actually care about because things will get rough. That's spoken like a man who's seen rough times. Sure. Can you talk about um, maybe your low point and how you got past it? Which one? <laughs> uh, I, you know, it's, it's, I was over lunch, I was talking to uh, another, another person who spoke this morning and I was like, you know, nobody, everybody loves to get up and talk about the hockey stick. And I've been on both sides of the table. I've invested other people's money. And it's always really funny, I, an investor recently um, asked me for financials for like five-year projections. And I was like, we're a new product. I have no idea what, um, you know, what our revenue is gonna look like. Um, but what I can tell you, of course, is it's gonna go like this. <laughs> That's shocker, right? I wanna, I wanna be in that first pitch where somebody's like, it's gonna go like this. <laughs> Give me your money. Um, so I'm ha I actually love talking about this stuff because I feel like it's important to sort of show that stuff. For me, you know, we hit a low point with SnapGoods. Nodes came out of SnapGoods. We hit a low point where, you know, we had about 50,000 registered users. We've been all up and down the press and the times. Like, it's really given us a really big opportunity to change people's way of thinking about collaborative consumption or the access economy. But I didn't see the kind of growth that I wanted to see, and I felt like the things that we were investing in, the ways that I was pushing my team, weren't resulting in material growth. That's a crisis of confidence in myself, because at the end of the day, I believe in my team. My team is a part of my family. And so if we fail, it's me. If we win, it's us. That's how I kind of view it. So I'll make sure if anything ever happens, everything blows up, all my guys will wind up, I'll make sure of it. But man, how come we're not winning right now? How come we're not growing fast? And that was kind of what I was dealing with, was like, I'm doing something wrong here. Um, and luckily I've got a great co-founder and part of finding a team is finding people who will honestly support you in moments of sort of darkness. I already told you about my lady, Lauren is amazing. And so I could talk honestly to some of these people um, but a really low point for us was that, was, you know, this is, yeah, I guess, spring of kind of, two, or early summer 2011, we had tried some different things, and I wasn't seeing the results that I wanted to see, even though we had 50,000 people in our system and kind of growing, even though we still have transactions every day. There was no way on the trajectory we were going on that we were going to be a profitable company anytime soon, and I had no idea how to fix that. And then one day I said, well, wait a minute. One of the fundamental things that's missing here is more effective means of leveraging our users' existing networks to find the right person that can give you that camera in San Francisco. And that was when I had the aha moment of, actually, okay guys, let's build a quick search tool and let's see how much are people engaging their networks? Is this an untapped resource? And it turned out that the average person in this room, give you a fun statistic, from the moment you've connected to somebody on Facebook, you've only ever actually talked to 5% of the people in your Facebook network. If you take out birthday shout outs, that number drops to 3%. <laughs> True story. My, I turned 36 last Saturday, I got 97 birthday shout outs. I've probably only spoken in any real way to 20 of those people. And so that was when we said, my God, this is a veritable gold mine. But the dark before that light was, I don't know what the hell I'm doing. And you're gonna have those moments. So that was mine. 
Give it up for Ron J. Williams.